once again, it's just good to be with you today and to worship and and to participate uh, with the services. Uh, again, so thankful to all of our, our volunteers that work so hard to pull these services together and uh, they're willing to practice and and uh, call in a, a group to help. Thank you to the musicians and and uh, everyone that uh, blesses our service. Uh, I'd like to pray right now. Would you join me? Heavenly Father, uh, we just continue in a spirit of worship today. And uh, it's our desire that your, uh, your heart would be blessed, Lord, as we gather, as we sing, as we give, as we fellowship, God. Um, just come again, I ask, into our hearts. And may your voice be heard in this place and give us wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, before I get started this morning, I, uh, I do want to reflect uh, just very briefly and uh, somewhat soberly on our services of last week. They were wonderful. I really enjoyed our guests and uh, our presenter and all the effort and emphasis that went into the service. I learned a couple of things. One thing I learned is I'm not the only preacher who sometimes gets loud. And that's comforting to me. I, I sometimes get excited and man, I, I, have a, uh, I can sometimes pump the volume into the mic and at one point, and I don't get to sit with my family uh, very often, and that's not a complaint. I realize that's part of the, the work of being a pastor, but uh, we were sitting uh, back here, and at one point, Bailey covered her ears and went, ah! <laughs> and I thought, oh, I wonder if I've done that to some people <laughs> sometimes, because I get excited sometimes, and I really just shout it out. So uh, I'm glad to know that I'm not the only one, of course. Uh, everyone has their different styles. Um, but secondly, something I learned is that as Pastor Smith was sharing, and he was developing his topic on hypocrisy and emphasizing how, you know, if anyone as spirit-led as Peter, even deep into his ministry, could be guilty of hypocrisy, uh, all of us can be guilty of hypocrisy, and I thought he did a really good job on that. As he got into some of his illustrations and contemporary things, he did delve into things that are highly political, are highly emotional, and there, by definition, are highly controversial. Now, we do not shy away from controversy in the church. I want to say that first and foremost. There are times, and by the way, in today's climate, you can hardly open your mouth or walk out your door without someone saying you're being controversial. So I, I realize that's the case. As your pastor, though, I just want to acknowledge and address that uh, some of you have shared with me that you were troubled. Some of you have said you simply disagreed, and some of you were offended. And so I just want to say from the outset, we're not here to have a debate or anything like that, I want us to use these moments, and I want to just share a, a few things. First, we need to be willing to listen to one another. This is one of the big challenges of our society right now. We need to learn to listen and to learn and grow, even when we disagree, even when we're offended. Uh, so we shouldn't be afraid of that. Um, secondly, and this is something that I think helps me and I've seen in my ministry, and I want to share with you, don't always rush to the worst possible interpretation of what you hear. I've had this happen several times. Uh, I was preaching on anger once, of all things. It's kind of ironic. And I happened to make someone angry. <laughs> they, they, this, was a, this was a dedicated deacon in the church. I made him so angry, he got up in the middle of the service and kind of a protest thing, stood up, you know. You could quietly slip out of church sometimes, you know, if you want. And then there are people who kind of... Uh, Okay, so this was, this, was not, uh, this was not a little thing. I made him so angry, he really got up, charged out of church. And thankfully, he was willing to talk with me after it. And, and as we were going through what made him angry, I, the, the thing that I said, I said, now, brother, how many different ways could you interpret what I said? And so we sat there and we talked about it. We came up with eight, he came up with eight different ways that it could have been interpreted. And I said, why did you choose the deepest, darkest, most malicious of those and accuse me of meaning that? We should know each other better than that. And we actually were able to have an, a nice moment of reconciliation. Praise God. And thank, thankful for the Holy Spirit reconciling us in that situation. But I've seen that many times. You hear something you disagree with? Take time to reflect on it and don't always rush to the worst possible interpretation. All right? Pray about it. And lastly, and this is something that Pastor Smith even said in his sermon and, and encouraged, don't be afraid to talk to someone that offends you, okay? 
don't be afraid to share with them, especially if they're in the church, especially if we are of the family of God, to say, I appreciate you, I respect that you have a background and a perspective. Can I share with you my perspective? And can we learn and can we grow together? And I want to share with you, please, you can do that with me. I guarantee you, you will not always agree with everything I say. <laughs> if you're smart, you would, but no. Uh, <laughs> I want to have the type of relationship where you can come to me and say, Pastor, I know that you care about us. I know that you believe deeply what you're saying, but I didn't quite follow this. Be kind, be diplomatic. Don't come charging at me with, you know, all the, you know, stuff, but just, you know, say, let's work this out together. That's how we grow, guys. That's how we grow. That's what makes us a family. So I just wanted to share that here at the outset. We're going to have a lot of different things that are, are going to be presented to us at times, and I know that doesn't solve everything for you in, 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 in you know, whatever you've been perceiving here uh, recently, but I just wanted to share those thoughts and, and acknowledge them um, here today. What I say this morning, too, um, some of you may not like, but I'm going to try to ask that the Holy Spirit uh, be the one speaking and... Uh, that we can all appreciate. And I don't know why I'm not seeing anything. I see it down here, but not on the screen. I always begin my sermons. I did have a little bit of a, a dry throat, so I do always begin my sermons with what I call a kid's quiz because I love the kids to be involved in the service. I love them to be a part of what happens here and to know that they are important. And so I like to begin with a kid's quiz and it really, oh, there it is. Perfect. Thank you so much to our tech team for helping us out. Um, we're going to be talking about the sanctuary today. 1210. We can do it. I'm a fast talker. We can do it. All right. Um, we're going to talk about the sanctuary in a few different ways today. What article of furnishing does not belong in the sanctuary? Now, if some of the kids may not know all of the articles. We might need to have some of the kids that are a little older participate in this. But there's seven pieces of furniture associated with the, with the uh, sanctuary. Seven. Okay? Of the four here, which one does not belong? Come on, I need to see some hands. All right. Oh, sorry. I saw this one first. We'll see if she's right. You say the altar of sacrifice? Okay, Gloria. You say the table of showbread? Okay. Uh, Ketsia? C? Well, you, yep. <laughs> We're now down to C. Does anyone want to say D? <laughs> We've said them all. So you want to know which the right answer is? It's C. Oh, come on now. There it is. C. The Holy Grail. You may have seen Monty Python or, or, or The Last Crusade or something. Okay. No. That is not part of the sanctuary. The altar of sacrifice, table of showbread, and altar of incense at different places are part of the sanctuary furniture. Now, the second question is the same as the first, but we're going to be using pictures instead of words. Which article of furnishing does not belong in the sanctuary? And I don't know if I'm just not in the right place, but I'm missing it. All right. Which of these pictures does not belong? All right, Ryan. The throne, he says. How many of you agree with him? All right, good. Good to see that. Yeah, the throne does not belong. In actuality, there is a throne in the sanctuary. It is the top of the Ark of the Covenant. It's actually called the mercy seat. And it is a different part. It's the seventh part uh, or the seventh piece of furnishing that's associated with the sanctuary. It is a separate thing. Moses was given separate instructions how to build the mercy seat, and then he's told, you are to put the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark is its own thing, and the mercy seat is its own thing as well. So those are the seven pieces. The altar of sacrifice, the laver, or, or the uh, basin of washing, then there's the candelabra, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant, and the mercy seat. My fingers didn't reconcile with that, but that's seven. All right, next question. Need the kids to help out. And this is just, I'm not getting the angle here. I don't know why. Well, 
There we go. Let's see if you were paying attention. All of a sudden, hands are in the air. Smart kids today. What does the word sanctuary mean? Oh, my, look at all these hands. Anna, have you had a chance yet? Anna, what do you say? What is it now? Oh, okay. I'm sorry, but that's wrong. So wrong. A place of refuge or safety, a protected nature reserve, a holy place, church or temple. Did you say it was D? Yeah. Well, you're right. But in a way, you're wrong too, because all of those things are that because of the first answer. So yes, it does apply to all of those, but a protected nature reserve is a sanctuary because it's been designated a refuge or a safe place for nature, right? A church or a temple is a sanctuary because it has been designated as a place of safety or refuge, okay? So it's one of those kind of tricky ones. It can be several different things. One more question. Why did God ask his people to build a sanctuary? Is it to protect them from his wrath? Is it to make them do what he asked? Is it to make religion complicated? I don't know if you've ever read Leviticus, you might get that idea. You did do what with the dove, and how are you to take it, and where, what part of it were you to do? Or was it to create a place where he could dwell with them? Man, Gloria, your hand went up right when the, that came up. I'm going to give you a chance here, Gloria. What do you say? You say D? She's right. I saw, I think it was Ketsia's hand on that one too. Were you going to say D as well? Well, you guys know then. You're excellent. Yes, it was to create a place where he could dwell with them. And many of you know this verse that says that very thing. God said in Exodus 25, 8, let them construct for me a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. And you may have heard that before. Maybe it's not very profound to you, but I just want you to think about that statement for a second. Of all things God could have done to create an opportunity to be with his people, he asked them to build a sanctuary. Okay. Now God is everywhere, right? God's in nature. We heard Chuck talk about that, right? He's in nature. We can have profound. God's in prayer. You can interact with God in prayer. He's in scripture. Of course, you can interact with God in a variety of ways, and we should in, uh, interact with God in multiple ways. But the primary way God calls his people to be in community with him is through something called a sanctuary. A sanctuary. Thank you, young people, kids, for helping out with that. I'm going to use an illustration here at the beginning and uh, uh, tell you a little bit of a story. In 2006, I was taking some correspondence courses for my master's degree, and we were in Sacramento, California. Um, and we were a, a cohort of students that had been working together. None of us were from California. But we got to know each other real well, and we were going to be there a couple of weeks. So we were talking about, what do we want to do on our downtime here in Sacramento? Well, some wanted to go to San Francisco, see Golden Gate Bridge, Alcatraz, Chinatown, that type of thing. And we did do that as well. But I remember my friend from Tennessee, his name was Alex. He said, guys, I am not going to leave California without seeing some big trees. And the way he said that just kind of made us laugh. It came, became a joke among us. We got to find some big trees for Alex. Well, we started to do some research. Where can you find big trees, you know, that weren't too far away from Sacramento? And we actually found on a map an actual park called Calaveras Big Trees. And we thought, well, it's perfect. He wants to see big trees. Big trees are fine. Let's go to Calaveras County and go to Calaveras Big Trees Park. Now, any of you who've grown up in California, if you've been to uh, these big tree uh, things before, uh, you, you might be able to relate with this, or, or maybe you've been there so much that this story isn't going to be as impactful um, for you as others who may not have been there or maybe only have been there once or twice. But um, I want to share with you our experience of going to Calaveras Big Trees in 2006. Now, I have seen pictures of these trees. I have seen documentaries of these trees. I've read all about them. I was not prepared, friends. I was not prepared for the power of these trees when we entered into that park. Pictures, again, I'm going to throw some pictures up here, but you know, how many of you have been to one of these before? No, oh, about a third of you. Okay, so that's all right. I don't know. Each of you have your own unique experience, but when you stand, now I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. We got some big trees in the Northwest, all right? We've got some firs and pines and cedars. They can get 100, 200 feet even, but the difference between a tree at 200 feet and a tree at 300 feet is massive. 
And we were there on a weekend. I think we went after church on a Sabbath. And there, were, there was just this general sense of awe of everyone in that park. I, I remember seeing kids jump out of minivans who would, who would talk with hushed tones. Dad, did you see that tree? You almost had this sense of you are in an otherworldly place. These trees do not exist anywhere else, and there's nothing like them. And again, pictures just do not justify them. So just a couple of anecdotes and stories about seeing these giant sequoias, giant sequoias. These are all from Calaveras um, Big Tree Park. This is known as a tunnel tree. It's called the Pioneer Cabin Tree. Um, all these trees have names, by the way, because they're so unique. If there's anything uh, special about their features, uh, they've been given names. There's Mother of the Forest and General Sherman. A lot of these were found after the Civil War, so a lot of Civil War terms are given to them, General Grant and things like that. And there's about a half dozen tunnel trees that have been made. They're very controversial. They're not made anymore because it obviously kills the tree. Um, but this was there in 2006, the Pioneer Cabin Tree. It's not as famous or as large as the Wawona Tree that is in Yosemite or was in Yosemite. That's the one that you see pictures of people driving through. Okay, that tree fell in 69. Okay, and then I just found out Pioneer Cabin fell in 2017. Fell in 2017, so it's not there anymore. It was there when I went, um, but it's gone. And when it fell, it absolutely shattered because it was dead. It was dead when it fell, and it just absolutely just came to pieces when it fell. Um, it was about eight feet high, that tunnel, about six or seven feet wide, and we walked through there. Now, they said when they bored the hole there, it had been scarred by a fire, and they said it's probably been mortally wounded anyway, so we're just going to make this as a tourist attraction. It wasn't. These trees stand for thousands of years. They've withstood fire and earthquakes and disease, but that was the excuse they made when they made this tunnel tree. Um, the Pioneer Cabin Tree. So that was one of the features there. Um, this one I want to talk about just for a second. It's called the Discovery Tree or the Discovery Stump. Found in 1852 when the first uh, uh, Eastern uh, settlers or, or explorers came and found it um, from the East Coast. And they, it was standing at the time, of course, and it was called the Discovery Tree. Probably the largest tree ever known to exist at the time. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about what they've discovered recently about sequoias. Um, it was probably 363 feet high when they discovered it. 363 feet high. Um, it was so large, they thought, no one's going to believe that these trees exist. So I know what we'll do. We're going to cut the bark off of it, and we're going to make it into like a puzzle piece. No one in the East Coast is going to believe us. So let's take off all the bark 10 feet uh, from 10 feet um, down to about breast level, and we're going to transport it back to New York, and then we're going to reassemble it. And that will prove to everyone the size of this tree. Well, how many of you know what happens when you remove the bark off a tree? It dies. The bark, by the way, was three feet thick. Well, wait, what's three feet? Three feet thick. That's how thick the bark was. They stripped the bark off of it, killed the tree. And ironically, when they took it back to New York, they set it in a warehouse. The warehouse caught fire, and it all burned up. So even their idea failed. Well, about six, seven years later, loggers came. They knew the tree was already mortally wounded, and they, they felled it is the term. And they don't even have saws to cut. Even today, you can't cut down a tree like this side with saws. They have to auger it using drill bits, and then they chisel it until finally it falls down. Well, this was uh, very uh, controversial even in the 1850s, 1860s when it happened. Um, so they took the stump. It became known as Discovery Stump, and they polished it down. They built a pavilion over it, and they turned it into a, some of you know this, a dance floor. A dance floor. They knew it would become popular from tourists from the east to come and see these big trees, and they thought they'd provide some entertainment. The uh, American naturalist uh, John Muir, probably one of the greatest American thinkers, uh, definitely in the top ten that's ever lived, John Muir said, he wrote an essay about this, and he said, and then the vandals danced upon the stump. You can guess how he felt about this. Um, 25 feet wide. Can I have, um, Sebastian, would you come up and help me for a second? 25 feet wide at its base. Oh, you're so excited. Isn't it wonderful? I just love the enthusiasm and the energy that comes from this young man. Would you hold this for me? Okay, let's stem it all the way over here. Okay, can you just hold it now? 20. This is a 25 foot long tape measure. Nope. 
No. That's how wide the stump is. It was big enough that 20 couples, 40 people, could comfortably dance on it. Thank you so much. These trees are just unlike anything you've ever seen in your life. Um, so that's Discovery Stump. When it fell down, they uh, counted its rings and determined it was 1,200 years old. Sequoias are the third longest living organisms on the planet. Um, there is a living sequoia today that they estimate to be 3,500 years old. Now, I just want you to think about this for a second. When Jesus walked the earth, if true, when Jesus walked the earth, that tree was still 1,500 years old. Okay? That tree would have been a couple hundred years old when Moses led the children of Israel across the Red Sea. And again, depending on your preference of dating of the Exodus and the patriarchs, that tree would have been a sapling when Jacob was stealing the blessing from his brother. That's how old some of these trees can be. Unbelievable. They are majestic miracles of nature. I could talk about these all day. There is a science and intrigue and interest. This is the largest tree in Calaveras big trees. It's called Louis Agassi. Louis Agassi was an American botanist that they dedicated its name to. It's got that gash in the side, but it's growing fine. It's alive. You can just get perspective of the person standing there. Um, it's, it's the biggest tree there, but it's nowhere near the largest tree um, of the sequoias. It ranks 35, 36. These trees change dramatically from every year. They can go uh, from being number 10 on the list to being number 25 on the list in just one year depending on a drought or a fire or other factors that make these trees change in size or girth or volume. So currently it's in the 30s somewhere. Um, and it's rare for trees to get over 300 feet. There's only about a dozen living trees known today that are over 300 feet. In 2006, the very year that I went to Calaveras Big, uh, Big Trees, um, some wildlife explorers just north of Eureka discovered the largest sequoias known to exist. And there's, their location is still secret today. National Geographic has been there, and the Smithsonian has been there, and Guinness has been there. But the state of California and other wildlife preservation groups refused to, to disclose the location. It's, the tree's name is Hyperion. It's 390 feet high. The second highest is also in that grove. It's named Helios. And then even the third highest, Icarus, is also in that grove. 300, I think 300, maybe 380. Some of you can Google it. Just Google Hyperion tree. I think it's maybe 380 feet high. Unbelievable. And then want to know how they know it's height? Because a guy climbed to the top and dropped a string down that was measured. Yeah? Awesome. Don't sign me up, but someone did it. Now, there's a couple lessons, uh, two lessons I want to draw from this, and I want to be very careful and sensitive in how I say some of these things. First, the object lesson related to the biology of these trees. What's fascinating about these massive trees is they have no tap root. In other words, they do not have a singular root that digs deep into the earth. Most trees uh, that grow tall at least have some modest tap root. Uh, cedars have a beginning of a tap root, firs. Um, I think even pine. Well, pine do have a tap root. Sequoias have no tap root. They never have a tap root. Their roots rarely go beyond 12 feet deep. 12 to 14 feet deep is as deep as their roots go, but they spread out forever. A single tree's root system will cover more than an acre of area, and they grow in groves. They grow together. As their branches and their roots spread out, they overlap one another and they hold themselves together. Sequoias cannot exist alone. They get their strength and their size by growing together. Secondly, this is something that cannot be experienced virtually. This is something that cannot be defined or 
you know, expressed unless you are present. How many of you have ever seen a whale? Isn't it different seeing that thing living than seeing it in a picture? Now, some of you may not be motivated by, you know, nature. I'm the type of person, I can watch a spider spin a web for hours. I can. I just see miracles and beauty. Some of you, you know, okay, if it doesn't have a ball and a bat, you're not that interested in it, right? Okay? But you can relate to these different types of experiences where being there is the most powerful way of experiencing something, okay? So now what I want to talk with you about this morning, I am just really having trouble with this. I don't know, it's, it's not doing it for me, guys. Thank you. Does the sanctuary still matter? Now, what I want to say here, I want to, I want to make myself very clear for a second. I realize there are people who cannot be here because of quarantine, because of medical reasons, and I realize there are some people still working out their comfort level to the risk factors, okay? I totally understand that. What I want to talk about today is a growing challenge among the Christian church about asking the question, do we need to be in the sanctuary at all? There are some people, and I, I, I'm kind of side of my eye glancing at the cameras here. If you're watching virtually and you could be here, you should be here. Okay? There's a re I, Look, when I was sick, I love being able to watch church from home. When I travel and I don't have a church that I can go to, I love that I can pull up my church virtually and digitally and be there. But we are engaging in a time and an era, and I do look a little bit to our younger people. When you get out of high school, get out of college, and you're making decisions, do I want to have a church that I interact with solely digitally? Is this sufficient? It serves a purpose. But a 20-minute interaction with the church virtually is not, the, or is not what the sanctuary is designed for. We stand the best when we stand together. We are strongest when we are together. And there are things that happen here that cannot and do not happen virtually. That's the challenge that we have before us. I have an article here. I'm not going to read it. The author simply says, you know, the church has been wrestling with how are we going to rebuild after COVID? I mean, even before COVID, churches were struggling with attendance. And now that you can buy your groceries online, and you can do your banking online, and you can do all of this, have social media online, you can have friendships, you can have romance online, for crying out loud. There's this new idea that church can always be online. Oh, I'm getting loud. Bailey, are you okay? <laughs> there's, a, there's a role for that but it is never a substitute for the ultimate expression of being in church. Psalm 73, guys, join me in your scriptures. I'm, I don't have it on the screen. Uh, I just put it there. Psalm 73. I'm going to go through it quickly. What a powerful psalm it is. Uh, sometimes we consider the psalms, you know, just poetry and songs and kind of whimsical expressions of faith and things like that. Oh, there's power and there is visceral expression in the psalms. And I want you to turn to Psalm 73 or follow along with me if you, if you don't have it. Uh, it's going to take us going through the entire passage, but I'll go through it quickly. I hope that you can uh, stay with me as we talk about this. Listen to what the psalmist says. Now, this is not a psalm of David. It's a psalm of Asaph. Asaph was a Levite. He's the son of Berechiah. He's in charge of the singers, all right, associated with the temple. So that's who Asaph is. Listen to what he says. Listen to the honesty of Asaph in this psalm as he shares it with us. First, he starts out with this blessing. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Sounds like your standard psalm, but notice the transition. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There are no pains in their death. Their body is fat. They're no trouble. They're not troubled as other men. They're, they're not plagued like mankind. Their pride is their neck. Therefore, pride is their necklace, and the garment of violence covers them. Their eyes bulge from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They've set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue parades through the earth. 
Now, this Levite is saying, look, I was struggling with my faith. Okay? I understand who God is, but when I look at the wicked, it sure seems like they got a pretty good plan. It seems like when they cheat on their taxes, they do just fine. It seems like when they live wickedly, they have a great time. Here now, I'm living in, in, priv- in privation, and I'm living sacrificially, and I look at the rest of the world, and it doesn't make sense to me. Now, he's being very honest. And if you were being honest, you would probably say, I've had thoughts like that at times. I've seen my neighbors in their speedboats, and I think, you know, if I didn't give tithe, maybe I could afford that. Why is it that they get to have all the fun? This is a very real expression of a challenge of faith that we're looking at here in Psalm 73. Therefore, come down with me to verse 10. Therefore, his people return to this place, the people of the wicked he's speaking of here, and the waters of abundance are drunk by them. They say, how does God know? And this is their knowledge with the Most High. Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They've increased in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. I had a lot of friends in high school having sex. Can we be honest for a second? And they'd say, what are you doing, Dave? You're missing out on a good time. You want to know what? I'm still married to my wife today. Most of them have broken relationships. I don't know, guys. This is what he's saying. In vain I've kept my heart pure, washed my hands in innocence. I've been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. He's in real trouble. He's in real crisis here. And he says, if I had said thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. In other words, he says, I'm not even saying this. I'm just thinking it in my heart. I'm not going to speak it out loud because if I did, I know it would be a betrayal of my faith. And when I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. Now, where is the solution for a Christian in this situation? What can be done to help them resolve this bitter conflict in their heart? When I was pondering to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. But here's the transition, and it's already on the screen. (laughs) Verse 17, until I came, where? Where did he go? He came into the sanctuary. Now, he's a Levite. He knows all about the sanctuary. But something happened in the depth of his crisis when he came into the sanctuary that changed his life. Notice the change I perceive their end. Surely you've set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. They're destroyed in a moment. They're utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Okay, previously he's saying the wicked have it at ease. The wicked are doing great. I'm keeping my heart pure in vain. Now he's looking at it saying their, their ultimate situation is horrible. When my heart was embittered, verse 21, I was pierced within. I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I'm continuing, continually with you. You've taken hold of my right hand. And with your counsel, you will guide me and afterward receive me to your glory. I just want to finish the psalm. Whom I have in heaven but you. And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Did you see a change? For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, there that I may tell of all your works. Now, I know I'm going through this fast, but I just want to ponder this with you for a second. What did he see in the sanctuary that could create such a profound change? I mean, when he's struggling with his faith, when he's looking around and saying, this is discouraging, all these problems, I'm not really confident what's going on. Well, of course, we can only surmise. I surmise that when he came in and he saw that lamb on the altar, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, you know, the wages of sin is death, but I've provided for you a substitute. And then he saw the laver. And he understood that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And then when he went in and he saw the lampstand, he understood that it's powered by the oil, which is the Holy Spirit. And he understood that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And he saw the table of showbread and he remembered what the prophet had said when he said that you shall not be hungry or thirsty, nor shall the burning sun scorch upon your head for my compassion and my love will lead you and I will guide you to springs of water. And he saw the altar of incense and he understood that the prayers of the saints were ascending behind 
the veil where the God of the universe was seated on a seat of mercy whose foundation is justice. He saw through eyes of faith in the sanctuary who God truly is. And had he not gone to the sanctuary, he may have still been struggling with his faith. When you come to church and you offer your praise of thanksgiving, it is not simply a whimsical expression. It is a powerful expression of the power of God in your lives. And when we do it together, it cannot be substituted for anything else. When we break the bread of the Word of God and study together, when we give of our tithes and offerings together, when we bind ourselves in fellowship together, is where salvation is found. The sanctuary is what makes the difference. If it wasn't, why does the devil hate it so much? We know in the last days, the devil hates the law, but we also know that he hates the sanctuary. And would I had time? Oh, friends, I, I wish I had time. From Daniel 8, talking about the little horn, he exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily. By the way, I use New King James here because I like it a little bit better than what I usually use the New American Standard. The word sacrifice is not in there, so I line it out. Um, he takes away the daily, and then they're taken away by him. And the place of his sanctuary is cast down. The little horn in the last days makes a priority the destruction of, and the reduction of the importance of the sanctuary. Because of transgression, transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily, and he cast truth to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another one, holy one saying to the certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled? Do you guys know what the next verse says? It's kind of the foundational verse for Seventh-day Adventists, right? And he said to me, for 2,300 days, and then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Now, I realize that there's a whole theology behind this, and that it's referring to a heavenly sanctuary that Jesus Christ himself is engaged in. But there is a application and an understanding and a meaning even in this context the seventh day adventist church was founded on the idea that jesus has made the sanctuary safe and it is a place where we can come before the presence of god and in the last days the devil is doing everything he can to sully and mar and cast down the power of the sanctuary and we have an opportunity to push back against that. Now, you may be thinking to yourselves, but pastor, I'm here. You're preaching to the choir. I mean, I'm here. It's not a problem. I'm not preaching to the choir. I am preaching to ambassadors. You are going to deal with people who are going to try to make the argument, I can just sit at home in my pajamas 52 weeks a year. I don't ever need to walk in the doors because I can hear the lesson, I can hear the songs, and I can watch the service, and hallelujah. You're the ambassador to say you're missing out. That's not what the sanctuary is. If that's what the sanctuary is, we might as well sell off all our buildings, put up a little studio somewhere, and just virtually send out our messages every week. There is a power and a purpose and a benefit and a blessing that can only be experienced in God's sanctuary. That's my message to you today. I pray that you would think about it, study it for yourselves, and if you agree with it, find ways that you can be an ambassador of that message. Again, I realize there are times we need to stay away. There are times we need a break. There are times that we are not going to be able to always be here. But if you can be here, you should. You should. God in heaven, Lord, I, I just ask, Father, that you would remind every soul that wherever two or three are gathered, 
you promise that your presence will be with us, Lord. Even if we're not in a modern building, even if we're among those who can't carry a tune but are singing anyways, wherever we go, we have the opportunity to enter into worship in a sanctuary, Lord. It is a sacred and wonderful thing. And we are designed to come together. And there are times to be apart. I recognize that, Lord. And we're still working out some of these things in our own hearts. And we respect the challenges that some face. But for any who are struggling with the ultimate question, Lord, I pray that they would hear your voice. And they would hear the voice of others who share the same perspective. That the sanctuary still is relevant. And we need the people to come together. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for these illustrations, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I hope that you have a blessed Sabbath. And I hope that, uh, I hope that this message is something you can reflect on. We will see you again soon. God bless.